Hi everyone, I'm the Canadian Lad and I just watched What If episode 8 at pointy febic speed. If you ask me, this was by far the best episode in the series. This gave us the real Age of Ultron, not just a few weeks of Ultron. So I'm gonna break it down scene by scene and try to explain everything. And I'll just give you a heads up, I did find some incredible attention to details in this episode, so make sure to watch till the end. But before I begin, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Displate. Displate is a one-of-a-kind metal poster that requires no tools to set up on your wall. It's super easy as they're actually held up by a magnetic mounting system so it doesn't damage the wall at all. The categories of posters are endless, from anime, history and games to food. And yes, they're printed on demand. In fact, they have over 1.4 million designs to choose from, so they'll definitely have something up your alley to bring any boring space to life. They've even partnered with tons of awesome brands like Star Wars and NASA. But obviously lads already know that I personally had to snag myself some Marvel posters. I love these posters because they're more like a grown-up version of the fun posters I had growing up. Another thing worth mentioning is that for every display sold, one tree is planted, which is amazing. I love supporting brands that look out for bigger causes, and I love that they offer fast delivery in 56 countries. Right now, Displate is offering my viewers 26% off the purchase of one or two posters and 36% off the purchase of three or more posters. So what are you waiting for? Get your favorite posters from Displate now. This episode opens in a post-apocalyptic Earth precisely in Russia, with Hawkeye and Black Widow fighting the Ultron robots. Now, it seems Seems as though whenever a disaster takes place, Hawkeye always gets a mohawk. Now he has some sort of a cloak that makes him invisible. Well, it could be a reference to Harry Potter, but I think it's more of a shield reference. And if you notice very carefully, it doesn't make him invisible entirely, as we can still spot his head in the scene. It works more as reflective panels that makes everyone else see through him. We see him shooting his arrows aiming towards the sky, while the robots were only a few feet above the ground. A brief reminder of what he did in Avengers 1 where he had to take the wind into account. Now, while fighting the bots using his arrows, he was literally disabling each one of them, except this one. This one he decided to kick instead. And notice, this is the only bot that actually gets back up and tries to attack Hawkeye once again. And over here, Black Widow literally beheads a bot just with a kick, while using her batons to behead another. Now, just to give you a little bit of backstory, in this universe, Ultron has essentially won, as opposed to the main timeline where Ultron couldn't upload his consciousness in Vision's vibranium body. The Watcher explains how the end of this world began with Tony's dream to put a suit of armor around the world. I see a suit of armor around the world. While the Watcher explains how Tony created Ultron, we get some quick shots from the main timeline, indicating how Ultron has already learned the past of each Avengers. We get shots from Thor 1, Incredible Hulk, Avengers 1, Iron Man and Captain America the first Avenger. This all goes by pretty quickly, so I thought I may as well describe it. Then the Watcher shows us the difference between our universe and this universe. In your universe, the Avengers stole the cradle to create the hero vision. Notice, when the Watcher shows us the moment Vision was born in our universe, Natasha is standing there with the other Avengers. But in Age of Ultron, she wasn't there, because she was captured by Ultron. So if he's talking about the main timeline, Black Widow shouldn't be there yet. Now there's one more detail here in this scene. Notice, when the Watcher takes us from one universe to another, he makes the same hand gesture as Doctor Strange does in live action. Even the sound effects are similar. Into one. Ultron has already killed every Avenger except Clint and Natasha, who were in a Quinjet at the time. Here we see Cap's broken shield as Tony saw in his dream in live action. What's interesting here is that Thor's hammer is surging energy, even though Thor is dead, indicating the hammer may be glitching. So Ultron must have managed to do something with Mjolnir as well. Now after Ultron came into power, he deployed all the nukes. And seeing all these nukes being fired, Clint says this. <sighs> Throughout the MCU, we have never seen Clint Burton verbally express his fear like this. He said it because he figured out what's gonna happen seeing all these nukes in the sky. Now with the Earth almost destroyed, Thanos appears from a portal. He's probably here because he's after the Mind Stone. He has all the Infinity Stones except that one. So it makes sense he would come to Ultron who now dons the Mind Stone on his forehead. But surprise surprise, while trying to eliminate half of all life in the universe, Thanos gets sliced in half himself. This scene goes to show just how much more intelligent Thanos was in our time. Timeline, where he sent the Black Order to take care of Vision first. It was Curvus Glaive who stopped Vision from phasing. Vision had to deal with this disruption for the entirety of Infinity War, which eventually led to Thanos snatching the Mind Stone from his head. Whereas this Thanos came to Ultron who not only can phase through, but has already conquered planet Earth. He couldn't comprehend the power of Ultron. And I like how even Thanos got shocked as he's about to be chopped in half. Now when Ultron used the Mind Stone and shot his laser beam, even we didn't understand what just happened until we saw Thanos from the back. 
back. It was animated in a way to create more tension. But notice if you watch it in slow motion, right from the get-go, you'll see how the laser beam has not only penetrated Thanos' armor, but has also gone through him. And I don't blame you for not catching this, we only see this for one frame. Another great attention to detail, eh? Ultron then grabbed the rest of the Infinity Stones from Thanos' gauntlet. Now here's a major difference between Ultron and Thanos. Ultron chose to have a suit of armor after he became even more powerful with all six Infinity Stones, but Thanos got rid of his armor once he started collecting the stones. One felt he needed more protection and thought beyond anybody's imagination by using his entire suit as a gauntlet, whereas the other was a bit arrogant. He thought the Infinity Stones are all he needs. Now just an appreciation for the director of the series, Brian Andrews, just look at the way he executed this scene. I, I really feel Marvel should hire him for a live action movie. I know this series has taken a lot of reference from previous films, but the scenes that are new, just look at the way how beautifully they were executed. So yes, I have full faith in him. Now as soon as Ultron activates all of the Infinity Stones, he says this. I see everything. That's the moment he realized there are worlds beyond his own. This makes me wonder, did Tony feel the same when he wielded all six Infinity Stones? I know it wasn't for long, but he did nonetheless. Let me know what you think about this in the comments. Now with this newly gained knowledge, Ultron has a new purpose. He planned to destroy every single world, and that's why he created an army of sentries using the Reality Stones. He even conjured himself a cape mirroring his look from the live action. Now I really love the design of Ultron's ship. It not only aligns with his look, but it gives an evil vibe as well. And notice when he teleports his ship to Asgard, the energy around his ship is blue, meaning he's using the space stone to teleport. I like how these details are almost always on point. After arriving on Asgard, it literally took Ultron 7 seconds to destroy the planet into pieces. Now nah, those foundations are gone, sorry. <laughs> but notice when Ultron used his double-edged blade to blast the palace of Asgard, the energy coming off the blade was purple, meaning he was using the Power Stone. He then travels to the Sovereign, where we see the Guardians of the Galaxy. This aligns perfectly with their mission from the beginning of Guardians Volume 2. Even though this scene was pretty lighthearted in live action, but in this one they're all killed. He then moves to Sakaar and reduces it to ashes. But notice how Korg was fighting to save Sakaar, whereas in the main timeline he wanted to begin a revolution and escape from this prison. Korg fighting for Sakaar goes to show he will fight for anyone as long as they're on the right side of history. Ultron then destroys the planet Ego. Now because Ego is a living planet, we can spot two eyes and one mouth, which actually goes from content to sad as soon as it gets destroyed. Cut to Xandar, which is about to receive the same treatment as Asgard, but Captain Marvel intervenes and says, Listen Skynet, I've seen the Killer Robot movie and I gotta say, I really don't think it needs a sequel. Skynet and a Killer Robot movie? Well, this is definitely a reference to the Terminator, but she says she doesn't think this film needs a sequel. This is because she had left Earth by the time Terminator 2 had come out. She was taken from Earth in 1989, and Terminator 2 hadn't come out until 1991, so clearly she has no idea that a sequel already exists. Now Carol flies into him, boring a hole in the ground. They plummet through the Earth as they plunge into the planet's core. Um, Ultron looks a bit like Venom here, doesn't he? And notice as they enter the core of the planet, the background changes from black to red and yellow. This is an accurate detail considering Earth's core is extremely warm. I mean, it's well beyond 9,000 in Fahrenheit, and it just makes sense it would look like this. But Captain Marvel couldn't hold Ultron for longer, as he got the upper hand and completely annihilated Xandar. Now, because Captain Marvel is powered by the Space Stone, the fusion of her powers and the six Infinity Stones created such a shockwave that it decimated every single planet on its way. Notice how far Xandar was compared to the rest of the planets, and yet the shockwave managed to cause this much damage. I like how the explosion of each planet corresponds to the color of the Infinity Stone that was used to destroy it. After completing his mission, Ultron stands alone, having no more prophecy to fulfill. He feels sad and fears eternal loneliness, just how I feel after publishing a video on YouTube. But having decimated every world around him, Ultron now experiences a new level of silence. This allows Ultron to ascend to a previously unattainable level of consciousness. The universe around him is so silent that he begins to hear the Watcher himself. And if you follow the eyes of Ultron, just as the Watcher begins to speak, he opens his eyes. He even rolls his eyes to his left, implying he can even sense where the voice is coming from. So had the Watcher only kept his mouth shut, instead of talking shit about Ultron behind his back, this insane motherfucker would have died out of boredom. So that's on you, Watcher. You should have been watching instead of giving us a commentary. But this also shows us just how powerful Strange Supreme had become in Episode 4. I doubt he'd listen. Hello? Who's that? 
he didn't need an infinite amount of silence around him to sense the presence of the Watcher. So if you ask me if Strange Supreme wields all six Infinity Stones, he will be even more dangerous than Ultron. We then see the chamber of the Watcher for the first time. And just as I predicted in my previous breakdown, the Watcher resides in a chamber of prism, where surrounding him is the multiverse. Wherever he looks, he sees a different universe. And notice, even the Watcher needs to open a portal from his chamber to see what's going on around the multiverse. And just like any portal, it works from both ways. Whenever it's opened, Ultron can see him as well. The Watcher gets really worried as he had never expected Ultron to obtain this level of power. He says there's still hope for this universe. One last hope, and that is Natasha and Clint Burton. Cut to the KGB archives where Clint and Widow search for the file of Arnim Zola. We learned in Captain America the Winter Soldier that Arnim Zola's consciousness has been turned into an AI. And that's why they're looking for his file, as he's the only AI capable of shutting down Ultron. The Watcher for the first time feels the urge to intervene, because Widow and Hawkeye are having a tough time to find Arnim Zola's file. The Watcher feels desperate, something we've never seen before. Natasha then discovers the Red Guardian shield, so it's safe to assume that Natasha's chosen family existed in this universe as well. That's why she uses humor to hide her true feelings about finding the shield. This is my color. Come on. And I like how Clint makes a reference to Star Wars A New Hope while searching for Zola's file. Sorry to break it to you, Nat. The Death Star plans are not in the main computer. The Death Star plans are not in the main computer. Clint and Ned then find out the file, and learn that Arnim Zola's AI is currently in Siberia in an old hydro base. Cut to Siberia where Clint and Ned finally find the Zola AI. They're in the exact same facility in Siberia that we saw in Captain America Civil War, when Bucky and Steve had this infamous fight against Tony. Ned explains to Clint who Arnim Zola was, and how he uploaded his own brain to a series of data banks. Now Arnim Zola's AI addresses Ned and Clint by their full name. Barton Clinton Francis. Francis? Really? How did I not know that? It's a family name. This is directly taken from the comics, as Hawkeye's full name is Clinton Francis Burton. Nat and Clint ask Zola to infiltrate Ultron's code and dismantle him, and Zola of course agrees to their demands. Widow then makes a phone call to the Avengers Tower to alert Ultron of their presence, and within a couple of minutes, the Ultron army starts to invade this facility. Hawkeye then uses an arrow-styled USB to download the program. Notice there's a smaller arrow symbol within the USB as well, which is purple in color. This is a nod to Hawkeye from the comics, where he dons the color purple a lot. Hawkeye of course used a similar tag back in Avengers 1 when he infiltrated the shield helicarrier. Zola then says Ultron is in the first genocidal megalomaniac that he had to deal with. This is him not only talking about Hitler but Red Skull as well, who he had to deal with personally. A massive fight takes place between the Ultron robots and Nat and Clint. Clint quickly shoots the data arrow that pierces one of the sentry's eyes. So basically what they did here is download the Arnim Zola program and then uploaded it to the sentry's body. Notice how the sentry now glows green instead of red, signifying he's against Ultron. But Nat shoots down his legs as a precaution anyway. After all, this guy aided Hitler Red Skull and Infiltrated Shield just to name a few. Zola then tries to dismantle Ultron, but because he's off-world fighting the Watcher, he's out of range for Zola to disable him. We then see some amazing action scenes, where Hawkeye and Widow go head-to-head -head against the Ultron sentries. But then we see the reversal of Avengers Endgame, as this time it's Clint who sacrifices himself so that Nat can escape with Zola. Notice how this arrow started glowing as soon as Clint put it in his bow, foreshadowing that Clint is planning to blast this entire facility, something that even he won't be able to withstand. I just love this shot. A great parallel to Avengers Endgame, where we saw Cap going against Thanos and his army all by himself. Widow and Zola then escape. And just like Yelena said, Natasha really likes to pose, doesn't she? Ned then breaks down in tears, realizing Clint is dead. Just like Clint did in live action after losing her. She then asks Zola why he wasn't able to disable Ultron. And he says he can't do it, because wherever Ultron is, he isn't in the observable universe. Cut to the Watcher's chamber. But this time Ultron managed to break in. Notice at the beginning, Ultron had to use all six Infinity Stones, even when he wasn't doing doing anything, indicating that just to be here, Ultron is having to harness the power of all six Infinity Stones. He then doesn't waste a second as he literally blasts the Watcher with the Power Stone. And from here, Ultron looks around and finds so many universes. That's like giving him a rebirth, giving him a purpose once again. And we can again see, but now in a closer look, all six Infinity Stones are still glowing. So he's harnessing the power of each one of them at all times, to stay here every second. That says something about the Watcher, isn't it? His prison fortress is so hard to break in, that it would take the might of all Infinity Stones to get there. The Watcher then manages to defend against the Power Stone. So notice what Ultron does next. He doubles the power by now adding the Time Stone in the equation. He fuses the power and the Time Stones and shoots directly from his chest plate. Now Ultron gives a message to all Spider-Verse deniers. Oh, but anything is possible in a multiverse. Anyway, notice in this scene the Infinity Stones are no longer glowing. 
meaning Ultron is getting stronger by the second. The longer he stays here, the less he has to depend on the stones. Ultron then punches the Watcher out of his prism, and he crash lands on a planet. We get an epic battle between the two as we see the Watcher conjuring his own suit of armor. Now notice, during their epic hand-to-hand -hand combat, the Watcher deflects all of Ultron's punches, and lands three of his own punches on Ultron, until Ultron headbutts the Watcher. But the Watcher retaliates with the same move. They go from one reality to another until Ultron becomes so massive that he literally devours a whole galaxy. This could be a nod to the character Galactus, who is literally known as the Devourer of Worlds. The Watcher then crashes through another reality and lands in Times Square. Here we again meet this guy in the pineapple t-shirt, which I did explain in my previous breakdown so I won't go much into details. Bystanders over here are now taking photos of the Watcher. I like that Marvel made sure the phone screen shows accurate detail, so kudos for that. Now behind Ultron in the Times Square billboard, we see Steve Rogers being sworn in as the President of the United States. So in this universe, he valued people over pussy. <clears throat> Ultron then punches the Watcher so hard that with each punch, the reality warps around them. We go from New York to Wakanda to the Middle Ages and also some scrolls. Not only the surroundings, but Ultron and the Watcher also get warped in different realities with each punch. Imagine being so powerful that you can literally punch someone to a different dimension. Notice the Watcher's eyes are not glowing here, meaning Ultron has actually knocked out the Watcher for a few seconds. And when he comes back to his senses, his eyes start to glow again. Now as Ultron is about to make the final blow, the Watcher disappears into this white portal. Now notice how instantly Ultron goes from the snowy planet back to the Watcher's chamber, from where he could access all of the multiverse. Him teleporting so fast again indicates just how powerful he's getting by the minute. To be honest, Ultron having nuclear codes is better than this, because now he can unleash chaos upon the multiverse. Cut to this prison where the Watcher begs Strange Supreme for help. Now notice as we are about to see Strange Supreme, for a second we could see the third eye on Strange's forehead. In the comics, Doctor Strange gains a third eye that he can activate to see things normal people cannot see. And where's the third eye? Right in the center of his forehead. Even in live action, Ancient One presses a thumb exactly on Steven's forehead and says, open your eye. Open your eye. Notice she didn't say eyes, it's singular. So this is again taken straight from the comics. Strange Supreme then forces the Watcher to admit that he's in need of help. And that's how this episode ends. This episode pretty much explains the promo where we've seen the likes of Captain Carter, Star-Lord, Strange Supreme, and even the Watcher himself fighting against thousands of Ultron bots. We're probably getting a big team up in the finale, so Marvel is following their original formula of giving us individual stories first, and then teaming up when absolutely necessary. Now if you like this video, then please give me a thumbs up. And if I manage to show you some details, that I didn't catch before, then please grab the subscribe button and turn notifications on. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter to get updates about my videos. Till then, I'm Dave Chappelle, and I'll see you lads in the next one.